Well, good evening to Space Odysseys. Thank you for being with us on this Tuesday evening. How is everybody out there? Let's just have a look, a quick look in the chat and see uh, who we got. Good evening, Derek. Uh, good evening, Daz. Oh, you're, you're on there as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, good evening, Stuart. And uh, good evening, everybody, for joining us. Good evening, Gerard, uh, in the world. And we're delighted this evening, as part of well, Roger and, and, uh, and Daz who you, and Michael, who you're familiar with, we are delighted to welcome to Space Odysseys, Mr. Pete Williamson. How are you, Pete? Whee. I'm fine, thank you. Yes. <clears throat> well, Pete um, is, um, is really the reason that we're here um, for, uh, for one, one reason or another. So we will be chatting to Pete a little later. And yeah. uh, we're just delighted to see him. And we hope that it's going to be the first of uh, many appearances on Space Oddities. So um, <clears throat> get used to him, as it were. So anyway, uh, we'll talk about a few things, first of all. Um, we did say originally that we were going to produce a calendar for Christmas with your images on from the viewers' gallery. And uh, if you may, may remember the debacle last year when we did produce the calendars, but actually the printing company <laughs> failed to put the dates on the calendar. So uh, we did say we would do that for this year. We decided not to do that for Christmas, but in the new year, we will be producing a picture book with our selection of the best images from the viewers gallery of 2023. So we will give you more information about that as soon as we've, we've sorted it. Uh, also, um, thank you so much to everybody who's been buying us coffees recently. It's very kind of you. And uh, if you don't know what that means, well, this is basically uh, what it's all about. You may buy us a coffee, which helps to keep Space Odysseys rolling. And you can scan the uh, QR code below if you'd like to buy us a coffee or as many as you like. And if you don't uh, manage to scan the QR code there, you can uh, you can go directly to the address. The full information is in the description of this video. So I will bring that back a little later. Don't forget that we have merchandise available. The Space Oddities t-shirt for the ridiculously low price of £19, including UK postage and packing. Please add £10 for foreign orders. And uh, they are, well, we've all got them, and they're wonderful quality. We can attest to the quality. Oh, yeah, Roger's even, the lovely, gorgeous, pouting Roger is even modelling one That's tonight. Nice. Uh, I, don't, I don't think he ever takes it off. No, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when was the last time you washed that, Rog? I can see it from here. So, uh, <laughs> so it's a wonderful T-shirt. And um, yes, I know it's not exactly T-shirt weather anymore, but it would make a lovely Christmas present for, for your granny and, you know, um, so or anybody, in fact. So, um, you know, uh, 19 pounds. We do, unfortunately, uh, have to announce that due to a, an increase in price from our supplier, we have to uh, reluctantly put our prices up after Christmas uh, so now is a good time to buy at the uh, the low, lower price. We also, of course, have Space Oddities hoodies available at the um, amazingly low price, uh, unrepeatably low price of £35, including UK postage and packing. And they come in two varieties, the uh, over-the-head variety, where the design is on the front, and the zipper variety, and the design is on the back. And they are very good quality, very warm, perfect for winter weather and being the first person on your street to be the proud owner of uh, of those and they are 35 pounds including uk postage and packing please add 10 pounds for foreign orders i wasn't actually going to be here tonight due to pressures of work so i actually haven't produced a, a regular news thing as i normally do so apologies for that but we've got uh, we've got uh, quite a few things to tell you tonight the main news of the week, of course, has been uh, SpaceX's second attempt to get their Starship vehicle into orbit, which we covered live on Saturday. And mm -hmm. uh, you will find a link to that in the description of this video if you haven't watched that already. And uh, as you may know, it wasn't a total success, but they got a lot further towards getting that Starship into orbit than they did on the first attempt in April. And uh, we'll be talking about that a little later in the show because it was uh, spectacular to, to witness, as I think uh, as everybody who was there will agree. And uh, without further ado then, let's, uh, let's move the thing on. And as normal, we will go to uh, the man with the mostest. He is, of course, uh, Roger. And Roger is going to tell us all about the uh, the night sky at the moment. So off you go, Roger. Wow. This week on uh, To View in the Clouds, 
<laughs> uh, yeah. As you do. Uh, between the 21st and the 27th of November. For goodness sake, where's the month gone? Anyway, we have a imminent full moon again next uh, next week. So uh, no doubt the skies will clear, especially for that, as it usually does. But uh, that's how things are. This was the uh, moon from last night. Uh, first time I've photographed the moon. Oh, lovely, Roger. Beautiful. Yeah, you had a bit of cloud. Uh, if you had a bit of cloud in Sparkford, then uh, a little bit. I mean, the last image of the moon I took was the uh, Venus occultation. So uh, oh, that was really nine. Good. So uh, yeah, it's been. But I have been doing some imaging between that, which you uh -huh. will see see later. Well, if you're getting clouds, Roger, get in touch with your MP. Yeah, I yeah, would. Yeah, right. I yeah. would. Have... Yeah. Anyway, so we've uh, got uh, some. Uh, Beautiful satellite, uh, <clears throat> constellations coming up now. The Orion is now starting to make headway now into the night sky. These are uh, for uh, 11 o'clock at night. And uh, we can see in the uh, southwest Saturn setting, unfortunately. But straight up, or, or quite high up, we've still got Jupiter, which is still dominating the uh, night sky as the brightest object until uh, Sirius arrives on the uh, off the eastern horizon and uh, Andromeda is very prominently placed with the uh, galaxy to be imaged there so uh, we've pretty much got the almost got the whole of the uh, winter circle almost up but uh, yeah will be always, so we've almost got that to uh, see so time's moving on now so uh, as we can see uh, on the 24th, we can see that the moon is getting quite close to Jupiter. And then yep. uh, two, two nights further on, it will be right adjacent to the Pleiades, but it will be almost full. So uh, the glare of the moon will uh, diminish the visibility of the Pleiades, unfortunately. But uh, in the early hours, of, well, before, before twilight, we've got Venus glaring away in the morning to... Uh, everyone's delight so uh, that will be a, a nice pleasant visit as it uh, traverses through Virgo but if you're fed up with that and would like to go comet hunting here's one to put on your list uh, it's not very bright at the moment in fact it's about magnitude 13 but uh, Comet 12P Ponds Brook is uh, traversing its way in the next month through uh, Lyra. All oh, right. And um, if forecasts and predictions are correct, by April 2024, it could be magnitude 4.4. Oh, nice. So it's if if it survives the uh, trajectory and uh, comes back to uh, into April, we'll be able to uh, have a fairly bright comet. And um, fortunately, um, the constellation will still be, uh, it will still be high enough for us to see uh, in after midnight, a couple of early hours. So uh, it will be visible oh. for uh, the majority of the time. So uh, one to look out for. Mm. Uh, I've just put a little uh, <clears throat> trajectory of it as it goes through for the next month through. So it goes um, past Vega quite closely on the, around about the 6th of December. So uh, good photo op for uh, anyone that would be interested in that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, this is where it will be on roughly the 6th of December. So it is up reasonably high for uh, a close, uh, close bypass of uh, Vega. So uh, keep an eye out for it. Indeed. Uh, yeah, and then obviously as it progresses through through 2024, it will fade quite rapidly to about magnitude 15 and further. So uh, mm. obviously uh, we'll be fed up and finding something else to do by then. <laughs> I noticed its its period. It said it was a, a Halley type. Yes, uh, comet because yeah, because it was discovered in 1812 by Jean Paul in. in 1812 and then uh, Robert Brooks uh, spotted it on its next return 
Yeah, he's and he's got a very similar orbital period as well, 71 years. Mm. Yeah. yeah, so uh, one to keep a lookout for. Absolutely. Well, not next so, time, Rain. <laughs> no, not this time. <laughs> so uh, is this what you've got, Daz, on? Oh, the... yes, yes. Lovely image, isn't it? Mm. So, uh, yeah, we've uh, got some interesting images of uh, of all these different uh, items here. And uh, here we yeah. have it, got it labelled. Um, yeah, it's um, it's basically a an image of the centre of the Milky Way, mm. um, taken by the uh, James Webb. Um, it's been colourised to so show, show the different regions. Um, mm. It says, uh, let me just read this. Um, it says this image shows invisible near infrared wavelengths of light that have been translated into visible light colours. The colour keys uh, shows a near cam, uh, which near cam filters were used when collecting the light. Mm. Uh, the color of each filter name is the visible light color used to represent the infrared light that passes through that filter. So that's basically a bit of technical gobbledygook yeah. there for you. Um, it says in uh, so a description, it says, in a, a field crowd, in a field crowded with stars, a funnel-shaped region of space appears darker than its surroundings. Uh, with fewer stars. It is wider at the top uh, edge of the image, narrowing towards the bottom. Towards the narrow end of this dark region, a small clump of red and white appears to shoot out streamers upward and left. Uh, the large, bright cyan-colored uh, areas surround the lower portion of the funnel-shaped dark area, forming a rough U-shape. The cyan colored areas has needle like linear structures and becomes more diffuse in the center of the image. The right side of the image is dominated by clouds of orange and red with a purple haze. I mean, it's just a beautiful image. It really yeah. is. Mm. Um, yeah. And of course, you've yeah. got it annotated there. So that gives the people an idea of what they're on about, so, of what mm. was on about. So, yeah. yeah. Mm. It is absolutely mm. gorgeous picture. Yeah, mm. I mean the the web has been used for so many different varieties. As we know, we uh, we've been looking at exoplanet atmospheres. Um, they've been looking also at um, neutron star collisions, um, yeah. and lo lo lots of uh, lots of things going on. Oh, and also um, uh, what are they called? Well, I know in other things. Let's put it that way. I can't remember what they're called. Well, now. and and don't forget, mm. uh, although it's not. It's not well publicized. Uh, James Webb has very clear and and dynamic uh, solar system science objectives. Mm -hmm. our own yeah, system. absolutely. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was having a, a bit of a dispute with somebody on Facebook over this who said, oh, I'm so glad the web has turned away now from looking at the solar system and those useless photographs of the planets. And I said, hang on a minute. Uh, this is this, this is all pre-programmed science. If they take an image of, of a of a planet it's for a particular reason that they want to take a, a, an image of mm. a planet so um so yeah, yeah. Can, you, yeah. can you put his name in the uh <laughs> in the, the first the first uh untested mission to mars yeah absolutely <laughs> definitely <laughs> definitely <laughs> yeah yeah how are you Lou? Um, anyway sorry welcome <laughs> thank you i'm sorry to join a bit late i had um, rather meetings on top of meetings today but um i don't mm. Like missing space oddities. Right. Okay. So we move on to a rather large gallery this week. Unfortunately, Rachel couldn't be with us. Um, no. Because of her. <clears throat> she's at a meeting tonight. So she's we're... at a committee mm. meeting. Committee. Meeting. Committee. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I understand they're meeting to try and decide when to put the Christmas tree up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I did see the debate before, yeah. before or after the first of December. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, yeah. We, we usually go for May. So, yeah. uh, so mm. yeah. okay, here we go oh, then. Mm. Okay, Lion Nebula. Right, oh. so we got the Lion Nebula in Cepheus from Sam Worthington, and he's put a lot of time into this 24 hours. Wow, 16 from, 16 yeah. from Leeds and eight hours from Ermita Nueva in Spain. Ooh. Two different locations, yeah. two different latitudes. Yes. Yeah, okay, and he's and he's used a little red cat 51. Oh. And here, and oh, there we are. Wow. Mm. Oh, wow! That is lovely. Yeah. Mm. Thank you so much for that. That's beautiful. 
Mm. I guess it's too far away to do parallax measurements, right? Yeah, yeah, I would think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. probably. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, very nice. Then we got another one of our regulars, Jerry Delay, with the tadpole nebula. And this is what he's. Oh, produced. Jerry, who did it again? Mm. Oh, beautiful. You can see beautiful. that. See it quite. See it quite plainly there. Yeah, indeed. Now, now the next one is also of the same object, but by Kevin Earp. Ah, uh, competition. In, Mm. <laughs> but this is in the uh, Hubble treatment oh, right. with uh, six hours and ten minutes and five minute subs. And this is what he's produced. Whoa. Oh, that's, that's, yeah, that's different. It's definitely different. I think it's upside down. No, just... <clears throat> it, it might have been better if it was landscape. Then the picture would be a bit bigger, but there we are. Oh, I think it's lovely. It's very good. Mm. Right. You're to go and never think of it. <clears throat> and now another one from Kevin of the Heart Nebula. Close up. This is this is now this is what uh, Rachel likes to do. Oh yes. Mm. Mm. How do they get those pinpoint star images when they are integrating over 17 days? I don't, I don't know how they do that. What he does is take the uh, stars out and then process the. Uh, the rest of the image and then put the stars back in so you don't mess up the uh, one by one the stars yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, with the pair of tweezers <laughs> yes very nice very nice. oh dear oh no oh no oh, no wonder it's well, a this, big gallery this, this is this is what happens when i'm in charge of the gallery <laughs> yeah 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 do you never give up <laughs> you will see my images <laughs> whether we want to or not Yep. Yeah. So this this is only forty minutes of the Orion Nebula and the Running Man. Oh, oh nice! nice. <clears throat> yeah, that is nice. That is nice. For, yeah, I, I only have four, so I couldn't do any shorter exposures to get the trapezium detail back in. So it's blown out a little bit, but uh, I was quite pleased with the rest of the all the painter dust that was around there. For, that is uh, beautiful for, for a short period of time. How many equipment you have there? That's pretty good. You know. Yeah, it was only a it's only a seventy one mil refractor. I yeah. know. Ooh. it's amazing. Mm. Yeah, almost First as good image. micro Lego. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Oh no, another one. Uh, another one. And this is the this is the cave nebula. Oh. Ooh. Wow. Mm. The colours. Mm. What a, what a my, lovely palette. My, my interpretation. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was originally going to be, well, it was shot in uh, narrow band, but the color processing went a bit awry. So I sort of made it into an RGB normal color. That is almost. beautiful, Rog. That's but there lovely. we go. Mm. Okay. Onwards to uh, Sonia Turkington. And this is using her C Star 50. Mm. So uh, she can do some star deep sky imaging that uh, she's always wanted to do. And this is how oh, her... Nice. Hmm. That's with a C-star 50 millimeter? Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's incredible. Yep. Hmm. There was a couple of those at Preston Mumford. Yeah. You'll start to see those more and more. Isn't it amazing? Well done, Sonia, for... Uh, yeah, well done, Sonia. Her, That's a her, lovely image. Her, early images and yeah. that's what we have for this week oh, thank you so that's much Roger. fantastic mm. so, so uh so so there we are so thank mm. you to all of our viewers for sending in your images as you know we do love looking at them we really do appreciate you sending them in if you would like one of your images to be part of our weekly viewers gallery then uh, attach it to an email and send it to space oddities live at gmail.com if you'd be so good as to have uh, send us just one image per email, please. And if you could entitle your email gallery entry or something similar so we can find it in the inbox, that would be much appreciated. And uh, and thank you so much. As we've said, it, they don't have to be deep sky objects. They don't have to be, you know, long exposures. If you've just got a, a sky shot with some, you know, earth things like trees or whatever in the foreground or the ocean, whatever, you know, we just like skyscape photographs as well and uh you know do send them into us 
and thank you for doing so. Right. Well, for those of you that uh, don't know him, by the way, uh, Pete, um, message, message from Derek there. Um, he says... Yeah, I saw that. I'm... Um, so, anyway... Um, Hi, Derek. Pete... Um, uh, oh, evening, evening, Gerard. Uh, Pete was the uh, creator and owner of the internet radio station Astro Radio, which is where all of us at Space Oddities met each other. And unfortunately, with the sad demise of Astro Radio, this is when we decided to uh, further our passion for telling our audience about the universe by setting up Space Oddities here on YouTube and Facebook. And Pete will be joining us, as I think he said, uh, most weeks, all weeks, or whenever you can make it. So, um, so that was, I'd like to welcome Pete as a regular fixture here on, on the panel. And uh, if Pete is, you know passionate about astronomy he once entered the mr universe competition by mistake because he thought it was about astronomy and um <laughs> come second yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right that's right um so anyway welcome pete and Thank first you. question is is would you like to tell the, the viewers a, a little bit about yourself for those of you who don't know you yeah for those that don't know me yes i ran astro radio for 12 years thereabouts and we started a show many years ago called uh, Reach Out and Touch Space. And that involved the panel, who you can see before you. Mm -hmm. And then when I reached retirement age, I decided to hang up my uh, telescope and my radio station and everything else that went with it and go off and travel around Europe, which I've been doing and I'm still doing. Um, I'm off again to Belgium, Switzerland and Germany and wherever and poland and and such like don't forget um, banger yeah. <laughs> don't forget banger <laughs> banger i'm going to banger and uh, yeah so so basically for two years i haven't really been doing any astronomy i've been traveling around europe enjoying myself drinking lots of beer uh sitting out in the sun and the things that you do and then i i had an inspiration the other day i, I, I thought why don't i go on to space oddities basically i haven't been on here for two years have i andy no, I mean, yeah. Andy no. hasn't changed in two years, really. Um, <laughs> it still looks the same. Um, Benjamin Button. Like Roger's T-shirt. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Roger's still wearing the same shirt. And, um, yeah, so, no, I decided to come back. But those that don't know me, I worked for many, many years as a professional astrophotographer, uh, working with varying universities. I've worked with ESA. I've worked with NASA. I've worked with them all, taking astro photographs, processing them, such like using large telescopes around the world. The one thing I've never really done is taken photographs with a telescope from my own back garden. Because when you've got telescopes based around the world, why do you need to put one in the back garden? But now <laughs> I'm not taking photographs with these wonderful telescopes. I've bought myself a Celestron 8-inch, uh, and I'm not going to be taking photographs with it. I'm just going to be using it for visual work. Um, because I've not done that since I was a child, and that's uh, a good few years ago now. Uh, you know, we're going back to the 60s here. And uh, so, yeah, so, you know, here I am. I've come back. I'm in a, a retired astronomer, and I'm here to help out and do whatever on Space Oddities Live. Fantastic. Well, you yeah. you are indeed very welcome, and it, it's welcome, so wonderful Pete. to have you. Sorry, sorry Michael? I'm saying welcome, Pete. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it's lovely welcome, to see Michael. you. Yeah. Yeah, it's lovely I've to see you. you. Apparently, I saw Michael a year ago. I thought it was two, but it was a year ago. Yeah, so yeah. It shows my concept of time since I was <laughs> completely gone. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so <laughs> as Pete has a great deal of experience with, with astrophotography, uh, I'm sure that if you have any questions about it that you want to put into the chat, uh, he would be more than happy to to welcome them, and uh, especially if you know you're starting out in astrophotography because we had a we had a conversation before the show about this new Sea Star telescope that everybody yeah. talking about. I, I, I've I've done a review for um a, a I'm not going to say who for a telescope company they asked me to review it, and I found I thought I think for people that have never done astrophotography before and want to get out and actually photograph something. It's great. The images, 
they're not brilliant let's let's be honest it's a 50 mil remote telescope it's not uh brilliant but but it's great for the beginner but you know at the end of the day you're not going to become an astrophotographer with a um with a c star unless you start processing your own images taking the data off the scope process it on a computer because at the end of the day in my opinion you're just pressing a button on a mobile phone and it does it for you you're not an astrophotographer at that point but you, it is great for an entry-level telescope to get in and start to learn i think it's brilliant i thought the image that we saw today in the gallery of the uh, orion yeah. Ad was yeah. fantastic. Oh, it was really to get absolutely an great with a, with a 50 millimeter diameter lens as well yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. The, problem, the problem is with that is, like you saw the images, and Sonia took a brilliant image there with the scope um, there, you know, but you need to go the stage further maybe and learn a bit more about getting the trapezium to pop out at you yeah. because obviously with the blown out trapezium, you're not seeing the full extent of the Orion Nebula. So I think Sonia's doing a great job. Brilliant, brilliant photograph. Really liked it. Yeah, and I've, really I'm well impressed with it. Well impressed. Um, and I'm sure she'll uh, she'll produce a lot more good stuff uh, in the yeah. next few weeks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we we hope equally that she will send the images to us when she does. So uh, of course, yeah. of course, I'm sure she will. I'm yeah. sure she will. So so uh, there we are. Well done, Sonia. Uh, really yeah. impressive image that was. And it just shows how far the technology is coming. Because what was that similar scope that came out a few years ago that looked a bit like it? That was several yeah. thousand. What was it called? I can't remember now. Uh, Unistar yeah. or something like that. Yeah, wasn't it? that's the one, yeah. and, and it was several thousand. You know, yeah. The mm -hmm. price of the price of these things is plummeting now, yeah. um, mm -hmm. and I think Gary uh, Gary had a one as well, and I think that might have been the Unistar. Um, mm -hmm. And there is there is a different difference in quality. Um, they use different uh, methods uh, to actually work, but mm -hmm. again, as Pete said, if you're just a beginner. Um, and you just want to get out and you want to see image for yourself, some of these deep sky uh, objects. Um, like I say, all you do is you just level the thing. Well, it, it, it levels itself up. It, mm. um, it, it it sorts out where it actually is sitting on the earth so it knows. Mm -hmm. And it, you can track, uh, it will track these items and it will slowly produce this image. But as Pete said, the next step, once you've got these images, is to take them off the, which you can do, uh, and then develop them yourselves and bring out even more and, detail. And, which is, and I, I, think I, I think it's good for um, outreach as well, because hmm. if you've got an, an electronic telescope like that and it sends the images to a tablet like we had uh, last week at the uh, Star Party, uh, it's great for people to stand around and look at the image on, on the tablet rather than every taking it in turn to go to the eyepiece for, for instance yeah yeah you're right you're right it's yeah. great yeah, outreach for outreach it's absolutely brilliant yeah mm -hmm. yeah absolutely uh, it's it's unistellar unistellar, yeah, unistellar that was the one that was the other one yeah yeah that was the one yeah and but it was very expensive yeah and, um mm. did a similar sort of job but it was you know i think yeah. that was the problem with being first on the market with something isn't yeah. it i think there's about three or four of them now. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was about so, three or four of them out now, and the prices are cascading. So, mm. Mm. and what's that one that Celestron do where you sort of clip your mobile phone to the, the telescope? I can't remember what that one's called, but yeah, I mean, there are all sorts of weird and wonderful devices coming out mm. now. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the, mm. the Celestron one is just an evolution with a bracket on it, basically. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, but it's great, um, you know, because I was worried after the demise of Mead. Uh, because I always saw Mead as the real innovators in in telescope technology. Um, I, I was worried that you know that might stop, but but there are so many different devices coming out now, and and at a fantastic range of prices as well. So um, I mean, I, I don't know if I'm behind the times or not, but has, have, haven't Mead resurfaced? Oh, that I wasn't aware of. Yeah, I, I saw Gary Palmer really? showing a Mead telescope. Said this will be a great thing to take home and try. So I didn't know whether that was a new oh, one right. or what. Mm. What do you know, Roger? What's going on with Mead? Uh, they are they are about, but um, I'm not sure exactly uh, who who are uh, in charge of it again. But, Perhaps somebody's yeah. just yeah. They are. You, you can name, get it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's that's always the danger, though, isn't it? If somebody buys the name and then produces inferior 
inferior. Well, uh, the funny, the funny thing is, I met up with a, a Celestron guy many years ago. I'm talking thirty years ago now, um, but I met up with a Celestron guy, and he actually admitted to me that the Mead optics and the Celestron optics were made by the same optics company. Yeah, I, I, nice. that would not surprise me at all. That would not surprise me. So what happens? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Oh, jolly good. Well, anyway, Pete, you are you are welcome here, and uh, you know we we do all of us owe you a lot for getting us uh, together in the first place, getting the band together, as it were. Yes, as yeah. such. Mm. Let's yeah. hope we can get the band back together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, yeah. you may not know Pete was also in a band for many years. Tell us about yeah. that, Pete. Yeah, I well, I've been in many bands. I mean, I've played with Anubis. I've uh, managed, well, not managed, but stage managed Budgie. Um, worked with uh, Hawkwind, played with varying Hawkwind members over many years, um, done a couple of gigs with Hawkwind as well. And uh, yeah, I've been on the rock scene. I was a, a, um, a rock musician for 40 years before I became an astronomer. So oh, that, was my, that was my first profession, was a rock musician. Oh. Then I injured my arm. You can't really see it, but I yeah. ripped all the tendons out of it. Yeah. And I thought, what do I do now? I'll become an astronomer. I have been an amateur. Now you've done another 40 years as an astronomer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, I'm a oh. Oh. I know where you live. I know where you live. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, talking, about, talking about that, Pete, uh, you may have seen that uh, Hawkwind recently did uh, a, a celebrated uh, Royal Albert Hall gig. Mm. And, uh, and Dave Brock of Hawkwind is 82. <laughs> Certainly still yeah. up there on stage. Well, the funny thing was Hawkwind, when they first started, Hawkwind used to, because I, I used to knock about with them when they were younger, mm. um, they played outside the Albert Hall, telling everybody music was free. Then, yeah, like right. 19, uh, 2000 and, no, 2019, they played inside the Albert Hall for 175 quid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh. They also played outside the um, the Isle of Wight Festival in yeah. 1970 for free, telling people, you know, you shouldn't have to pay for music. Times change. Times change. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so we have, you know, we're lucky to have uh, such a celebrated musician, rock star, um, uh, astronomer and all-round good egg joining the Space Odysseys panel. Well, thank um, you very much. And yeah. uh, we hope you'll be very happy here. Yeah, Pete. give our regards to Sib, your new boss. Yeah. Oh, she's, <laughs> yeah, she's downstairs. She'll be uh, ordering me about later. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Doing your chores list. <laughs> Let's move on. Uh, as you may have been aware, especially if you joined us live on Saturday, SpaceX attempted to get their Starship into orbit for the second time. Why is this important? It's important because SpaceX are contracted to create the landing vehicle for humans returning to the moon, the pro current projected data, which is, is around 2026. SpaceX will be supplying a lunar variant of their starship, cunningly called the Lunar Starship, to land humans back on the moon as part of the Project Artemis program. Therefore, it's very, very important that SpaceX actually get the Starship working and get it into space. Well, they did manage to get it into space on Saturday, but it didn't survive very long, unfortunately. And uh, both the, bo and the booster and the Starship itself were, were lost. But it was a spectacular flight, which went much better than I think anybody dreamed it could, uh, considering the problems they had with the first orbital flight attempt in April, on April the 20th, when um, they had multiple problems with the Raptor engines on the Falcon Super Heavy booster, and they did a bit of spontaneous mining underneath the launch mount, uh, which was uh, not really intentional and, uh, and really upset the fish and wildlife people. And I just tell this story because uh, I think it's lovely. The Fish and Wildlife Service have been conducting an environmental study into whether they're going to let SpaceX launch again and launch multiple bits of concrete into the ocean and upset the wildlife. And they asked SpaceX this time to come up with an actual probability of falling debris um, injuring a shark in the Gulf of Mexico. And um, SpaceX replied, well, we can't really give you a probability because there's never been any recorded incident of any space debris injuring a shark in the Gulf of Mexico. But they came up with this mathematical formula for 
calculating it, and they they did. They calculated it, and they told the Fish and Wildlife Service the probability is as close to zero as you can get. It is possible to estimate. So the, the FWS were quite happy with that. But they've also been asking SpaceX about their landings at the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, where SpaceX land their Falcon 9 sometimes. And they asked SpaceX um, to, uh, to certify that the eels, the eels, the ears of seals, try saying that after a few, the ears of seals are not damaged by the sonic booms that the Falcon 9s make when they return. So SpaceX, and this is a true story, and you can see the photographs on the web, SpaceX had to go and trap a seal, put headphones on it, play it a sonic boom at the, le at the sound level that it might hear when a, a Falcon 9 returns to the Earth, and observe the behavior of the seal to see if it was in any no. distress. No. And uh, no, it's Lou. This is absolutely true. This is absolutely true. And um, and the answer came back. The, the seal couldn't give a toss. He was quite happy. Didn't bother yeah. having a, a, a sonic boom played through headphones. Yeah. Uh, I should have played some Motorhead. You know, they're going to say yeah, so upset it wasn't Hawkwind. Yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, so so it got the FWF's seal of approval. You didn't see it coming. Uh, so, uh, but wait a wait a minute! I didn't know seals had ears. Yeah. Well, how do you think they hear? Uh, <laughs> there's nothing <laughs> flapping about on their heads. Yeah. Well. Well. Um, they're little biology. tiny things just behind the, have, the, the aqu there. Aquatic biology is obviously not your speciality, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. I leave that to my wife. Yeah. <laughs> your homework. Show me a picture of a seal. Do, do a presentation about the yeah. seals. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're little triangulars. Oh, there you go. There's no, no. Oh. <laughs> One. Oh. That's lovely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, you can go and search for this picture on the web of the seal with headphones. It's it's absolutely hilarious. So SpaceX had to do all this uh, to get the approval of the FWS. But anyway, I digress. Daz is now going to tell us all about um, both attempts to get the, uh, the Starship into orbit, and uh, and what happened. And if you were watching with us on Saturday live for the second orbital flight attempt, thank you. That's what we want to say. So, Daz, over to you. Right. Okay. Then, well, I would th first of all, can I just um, wish uh, a, 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 a get well soon to Keith, one of our um, panel uh, members. Yes. Um, he's just had a quite a serious uh, operation on his um, neck and spine, um, and he's recovering well. But we all we all want to wish him well and uh, hope you're back soon. And uh, we're yes. keeping your seat warm. So. Absolutely. Yeah, best wishes to you, Keith. And uh, best wishes, Keith, keep if you're watching. Strong. Yeah. And hope to see you here soon. So, uh, so, so there right. we are. Okay, then, if I can get on with this, right. First of all, what I would think I, I would do is I re will re review the uh, first orbital attempt um, uh, going back to April, beginning of this year, um, and of course uh, we all. We're full of anticipation and excitement when it uh, it took off, um, and we, we we really didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, but of course, on April uh, in April, it, uh, the time came round and they actually launched the thing. And the first achievement is they got it off the pad. Um, but of course, we know that within a very short uh, amount of time, that things were going terribly wrong. Um, Three of the engines didn't start on the actual startup. And you've got to remember, there are 33 Raptor engines at the base of this rocket, which because it it's going to take some lifting, all this weight. Um, but three of them didn't um, uh, start from the go or were damaged um, by th uh, certain things that happened that, of course, Andy uh, referred to the excavation of the, uh, uh, the unintentional ex excavation of the launch pad uh, and things like that. But eventually, it actually took off. It lost more engines on the way up due to damage and due to uh, things just basically going wrong. Um, and in the end, it had to self-destruct. Um, and there was also an issue with the self-destruct it was given. If you look at these four images I've got here, 
Um, the top left, you can see things are beginning to go awry. You can see engines are uh, popping out, the, the sort of like the orange glow at the base of the exhaust there. It started to tumble. In the uh, third image, that's bottom uh, left, you can just see that the uh, self -deta detonation uh, charges have gone off. You can just see the slight puffs of um, gas, as a, a, a fuel and oxygen just leaking out. But it took a little while of, and a bit more tumbling before it actually exploded. The idea is that the, um, the self termination is that it should explode straight away. But it took, I think it took about 40 seconds of continually yeah. turning. And it's when it, uh, it rotated back through its own exhaust that it exploded, which is the, uh, the last uh, image in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, as we said, uh, the unintentional consequences is we had lots of debris because they didn't, um, they thought they wouldn't need a flame, flame direction trench or a um, water suppression system. Um, and as a result, lot the um, launch pad was excavated uh, and the concrete was thrown over. It actually covered um, four square kilometers uh, where they found lots of debris. And also a lot of it went out to sea and was splashing in the sea. And I suppose this is where they, they were concerned about sharks. Yeah. Uh, let's put it this way. If sharks are in that close, I think the people have got more, have more concern. <laughs> yeah. um, now, in the top image here, you can see on, in, on the left, there is a car. Now, this car, and these images are uh, courtesy of uh, NASA Spaceflight, that is their um, camera car, as they called it. And if you can look at the back, you can actually see there's a bit of a dust cloud on the, on the actual back of it. And it's just actually been clobbered by a big chunk of uh, concrete. Uh, and it, it sustained quite a bit of uh, damage. And then um, just um, the, the other image, you can see that the, the uh, dust cloud has expanded and you can see all the rubble coming towards these cameras. This area, is, I think, is about one kilometre away. And it's where people are allowed to set up uh, remote cameras to uh, image the actual takeoff. So this was, uh, remember, this was the first image. As I said... The uh, debris was thrown out over four square kilo, uh, kilometers. Uh, very large pieces of concrete, as you can see, have embedded themselves in the soft earth around. Uh, even the, you can see the same beware sign. Well, that's not doing much good now, is it, being out, yeah. let out there? Uh, and also, you, we had parts of the actual uh, launch tower. Uh, some of the cladding was ripped off. And there was even a door, which is sort of like a door that you get uh, on a submarine was absolutely ripped off and bent uh, and thrown uh, several meters, uh, several hundred meters away. Mm. So uh, the, we knew something drastic had gone wrong when we could see it. So uh, the next image, also the uh, fuel tanks and the oxygen <laughs> tanks that are quite close by, as you can see, these are actually been refurbished. They've been painted and the, all the holes patched up. Um, but you can see they're still quite well dented from that original takeoff. The the, uh, the they did take quite a pound in. Um, so after that, we had and here is the hole that was excavated by those thirty-two wrapped well, thirty wrapped rendings in the end. Um, and of course, most of this uh, debris um, came back up into the engine bay, and that's probably caused some of the damage. But also, because it's a solid base, a lot of the damage would have been done by sound, um, bouncing back off of the concrete, back up into the actual rocket itself. And that can cause um, a lot of damage in its uh, own right. So uh, so what um, <coughs> NASA have done, uh, sorry, not NASA, SpaceX have done, is they've introduced this new deluge system. So what they've done is they replaced all the concrete, but while they did it, they actually put a metal plate underneath, which is actually full of holes. And they set up a whole pipework system and a storage system where they pump water underneath the actual rocket, and it acts like a bidet. It's actually forcing water up towards the bottom. There's also, uh, in, this, in the uh, stand there, there is also a ignition suppression um, uh, ignition uh, system, which actually 
wets the pours water uh, injects water into where the engine bay is and it's to stop any um a surplus methane that has leaked out from igniting that's the last thing you want is any leaking methane to ignite while you're actually lighting your engines so this uh, um system uh the amount of water that and it, uh, if i remember rightly i'm just trying to get this right the water is ejected out of the holes and out of the system at three thousand psi per, uh, per square inch um and cubic uh, per square inch the actual amount was just uh, the uh, water that is used and is um it has to be tanked in by tankers is just under 400,000 gallons. It was 380 odd. I think it's 386 altogether. It's pumped through this system in a matter of seconds. Um, and of course, because it's under such high pressure, it produces um, a loud noise. And the wildlife and game uh, uh, fisheries people said that we should scare away any birds or anything before the actual engines ignite so they were quite happy with this system the only thing that they wanted to be be looked into was the um the effect of the water because this water is is basically tap water so it's chlorinated um the area surrounding the launch pad is a um a, a sort of like a, a a brackish area all the water is brackish it's a mixture of salt water and um rainwater uh, which produces its own ecosystems, and this is what they were concerned about: that if by pumping all this water out every time, that it's going to cause uh, a change in the actual ecosystem. Um, so this is why the wildlife. Um, no, that's not why, wasn't it? So uh, that was basically the the first uh, one. That's the uh, uh, the first orbital attempt. Now let's talk about what actually happened. Oh, we got. <laughs> Lou, where'd you get that pic? <laughs> He's found the photo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. Fantastic. Nice one. Right, okay then. So let's do an autopsy on the first launch, on the second launch. Right, so uh, the, the now this was all very, very rushed. Basically, we, we heard last Tuesday that there was going to be a launch tent. Um, well, basically, the, we were told that the... Um, wildlife and fisheries had finished their um uh their exhaustive uh, investigation and they were happy with these launch to go ahead but there's 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 lots of caveats to that um and it involves that virtually after every launch and every so often spacex have got to go out and do a major survey of the whole area testing the water um and uh, the surrounding area checking the fauna um, because one of the things that they also were concerned about is that since they've installed the deluge system, um, the uh, they've done several tests, and what they've uh, they've found is that, like um, on a, uh, a on a, a, a capsule returning, the heat shield, the reason how it dissipates heat is, is through ablation, which means basically it heats up the um, material flakes and then flows off and it takes a lot of the heat away. But so it get, as it comes through the atmosphere, it gets thinner and thinner. Well, of course, it's the same situation here. And it was the same with um, uh, the shuttle and everything else, that when with all this power that you're putting through into the ground or whatever it's actually standing on, you get ablation. So this metal, and it's we're talking about pounds of this metal each time, um, ablates off the surface of the um, the actual deluge system, and that also goes out into um, the environment. But also, it it gets evaporated and it's turned to mist, and most of that will uh, just mist out over the the local area, and maybe even form an, an own its own lo localized shower. But also, it can be picked up by any breeze. And carried some distance, and in 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 that mist itself will be all these particles and metals and dust and sand and everything. So again, this is one of the reasons they have to do um, 
uh, they have to do uh, the, all these tests after um, each thing. Um, they, the uh, Fish and Wildlife Fund um, think uh, said that really the, uh, uh, they estimated that spa um, the Starship launches uh, or the Delu system will be used about 30 times a year. And uh, they said, uh, but most of that, of course, will be taken up with deluge testing, uh, system testing. There will also be testing of uh, rocket engines, um, pre-launch systems and stuff like that. So but, but they reckon there's going to be between eight and 12 launches per year. Um, but they, they estimated that the water sheet that will spread out across the area, most of the water will be caught in um, uh, lakes and ponds specially built for it. Um, but there will be a, um, a water sheet that will spread out. But they said it will be no worse than actually having a heavy rainfall uh, in that area. So anyway, let's have a quick look at, um, let's have a quick scan through the, uh, uh, the second attempt. So uh, here we are. Now, this is what, what I was fascinated with watching this Saturday is all the different angles. Now, this was taken from one of the SpaceX drones. And prior to this, uh, this the ignition of the engines, the, you saw the rocket, which was all, all the condensation was flowing down the rocket onto the floor, and it was spreading out, and it was a really fascinating um, sight to behold. Um, so, of course, they, uh, the uh, deluge system came on, uh, and uh, they launched successfully. So, here we are. Now, this is, um, I hope you can see this. You know, I've got, it um, looks like something's cut off. Oh, is this the, the scrolling? Um, what we've got here is an image of the actual rocket clearing the tower, but underneath we've got the SpaceX uh, telemetry. And as you can see, we've only got the telemetry for the booster section because that's the only bit that's um, uh, actually flying at the moment. And if you look, look how many engines we've got going. All 33, 33 all of them. And that was the, that was the first bonus. None of the engines actually cut off. Um, now I'll quickly go through these because there's quite a few slides here. So as I said, they took off. Uh, it rose majestically into the sky. All uh, 33 engines. And uh, it's worth pointing out as well that because they hadn't lost a few engines, it rose much quicker into the sky this time than it had. A lot, lot smoother. Yeah. Yeah. A lot, lot quicker. Lot quicker. Um, so it's uh, as I said, it rose majestically. You can see all the engines are lit here. Um, I've actually cut off the, <laughs> the telemetry there. <laughs> what a Dylan! Anyway, um, so here we are. As I said, all thirty-three engines. Um, I got Amazing to thank Andy for these pictures. Look at it. those images; they're absolutely fantastic. And thanks to SpaceX for these. These are actual SpaceX ones. That's it. Thank you. I, I, I yeah. pinched them off of you, but uh, yeah, yeah, they're, SpaceX, they're, they're, so yeah, absolutely. They're, they're but, official SpaceX images. Yeah, but look at it; it's actually a wonderful sight to see all those engines and such power yeah. powering through these things. And it's uh, as I said, everything went fine. Um, so again, as I said, everything was uh, thirty seconds, seven, thirty-seven seconds in. Everything's going fine. Uh, all the engines are still lit, and then we came to uh, two minutes thirty-nine where they started to close down engines ready for the hot staging. Uh, now, as you can see um, on the telemetry, you'll see that they've got uh, several engines out. And what they did is they um, shut the engines down in groups of five. Um, and it, it was done quite over quite a fast um, uh, over a short time. So it was hard to actually catch them until in the end, we only had the three central engines going and you can see this is what all this exhaust this stuff is here this is where they've shut down the engines and you've still got some excess uh exhaust so at two minutes 40 then we had the hot staging and as you can see that here you've still got three engines going on the booster but you're beginning to see the flames coming out the hot uh, staging ring um now there's two ways you can uh, release uh, a staged rocket one is that uh, you basically just shut off all the engines from the booster and then let the momentum, then release the clamps and then let the uh, top stage float away. Then it will light its own engine and fly off. But this is a technique called um, hot staging where you actually start the engines while it's still connected to the booster. 
Uh, and what you have is you have a ring around the middle of where, where the engine bay is, and there's slots and uh, holes in there to allow the exhaust um, uh, to um, uh, to escape. And also, it's got a big dome in the in the bottom of it to protect the actual booster stage. Dad, should but, I jump in at this point and just quickly show the slides about that? Yeah, if you wish. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, if yeah I'll come okay. off then, and then I'll, I'll carry on from where I am. Okay, can you just take yours off and uh, no, it? There it. so this is just uh, it's called hot staging. It's something that was completely new to SpaceX. SpaceX's first idea was to spin the booster and release the clamps and um, let the um, let the uh, centripetal force of the rotating rocket carry it away. But then they thought, for whatever reason, they thought better of that. And they're now using this hot staging, which is something the Russians have been using with their Soyuz rockets for, for decades. So it's not new to, to, to space flight, but it's new to SpaceX. And this was the first time they'd tried it, and it appeared to work absolutely perfectly successfully, as you see in the photos. So um, that's taking a while to load, isn't it? I wonder why that is. Okay, not to worry, but we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. That's, that's basically all I wanted to say. So if you'd like to put yours back okay. up there. Dad. Yeah. So we've got to two minutes, uh, 44 seconds, and it's uh, they, they, we've started separation. Um, but, of course, as soon as they shut off these uh, the, the main booster engines, the whole uh, uh, vehicle itself started to slow in its um, acceleration. So, if, in fact, in what, this is what probably one of the reasons why they think that the, um, what happened next uh, happened. So... Basically, the next image, uh, again, this is another image of the uh, hot staging uh, firing off. And you can, this is a black and white image. I hope you can see that because it doesn't look very clear on mine. Um, no, but this is, you can see the exhaust being lit um, mm. and uh, illuminated by the sun and it, all the exhausts interacting. And it gives us this lovely halo effect. Um, so this was a color image from ground. Um, you can see that uh, the hot staging has begun and you can see all this being lit by the sunshine because this was uh, um, quite early in the morning for uh, mm. uh, Boca Chica. So, uh, so you can see it started off, gave us this lovely sort of like, well, I would say an open rose effect. Um, that's quite poetic for me. Yeah, I was going to um, say, that's, that's not yeah. like you. Um, and here's another image. This is fantastic. Oh, that's Look a wonderful that. image. Look at that. That mm. is absolutely beautiful. Um and uh, yeah, that uh, it, it's an absolute stunner. It never gets old to see images like this. No, I mean that that's um, definitely got to be a contender for, for yeah. image of the year. I mean that yeah. is just unbelievable. So we've started um, hot staging. You can see here the booster is now beginning to move away. And as I said, the booster because it's been hit by the uh, blast of um, the the engines from. Uh, the starship actually leaving it slowed down quite a lot now this is where some of the theories come in of what's actually happened is that the uh, because everything started to slow down the fuel and remember you can see it's quite if you look at the telemetry the locks and the methane are quite low um so but the, the liquid that's in there will now be able to slosh around in the tanks. And this is what happens when things deaccelerate. The um, fuel will move away and it will actually possibly leave the point where the fuel is picked up and piped to the engines. So what we'll do is I'll just flick through these um, quickly because what we're going to do is, first of all, we're going to follow the, the booster and what happens to the booster. So, of course, it starts tumbling. And straight away, you can see, look at the telemetry, they've started re to relight the engines. Yeah. Now, this, all the... Sorry, I was going to say, this is, this is uh, in preparation for the, for the boost back burn. Yeah, yeah. Where, so where... what they're doing is they're starting all these engines one by one, but it happens so quickly, it's hard to catch them. But if you watch the telemetry as it uh, comes in, you can see it's already started to move away. Uh, you can see it's what its attitude is as well. Um, it, they had the telemetry hasn't caught up with the starship yet. It still looks like the engines haven't lit, but they have. But as I move on, you'll see the engine slowly light up, and the the inner free and the out, inner ring have lit all except one. Mm. 
Now, from now on, basically it's doomed. Um, and what they think is that this all this fuel was, was sloshing around. And the problem is um, there's two things. You get there's the sloshing of the fuel, but also there's a thing called um, engine hammer. And what they do is if they, and this is why they start all the engines um, one by one, and uh, so to try and reduce this effect, that's because by starting the engines again, it really hits into the, the engines and it can cause damage. So they, they light them one by one to reduce as much uh, impact as they can. So almost, so it's uh, two minutes 51, they've relit the engines they're going to do. And as Andy said, this is for the burn back um, uh, phase of the flight. The booster is supposed to fly back towards um, wherever it's going to land. And to do that, it starts its engines, pushes itself over. It was going to the Gulf of Mexico, this was, um, where it was going then to um, do a re-entry burn, free fall, um, and then at the end, just do a, uh, like the engines, but what they were going to do to slow itself down and it'll have a soft landing in the Gulf of Mexico. Because this is the first time this thing has actually flown uh, to this part of the uh, the, the stage, uh, get to this stage. So I'll quickly th flick through these because there's a few of them. But as you start to watch, um, as it starts turning, we've already started to lose engines. In three seconds, we lost another two engines. Um, you can see the uh, trying to correct itself, get itself in the right attitude uh, for it to be able to do its um, uh, come back down again. But again, we're losing more and more engines as we go on. By three, we've lost most of the engines. Uh, we, and some of them are associated. Uh, you've got this big outgassing here. I don't think that's one of the correction jets nozzles. Um, but occasionally when some of the engines went out, you did see a bright flash at the, in the engine, uh, the, the rocket bay area, uh, which were associated. So by this time, the, the thing's doomed. Um, it's spiraling out of control. Um, you've got all these jet things um, puffing out. Um, and whether or not that's a, a fuel leaks or anything, we're still losing engines. And as you can see, there is a bright flash there. We're associated with another engine possibly going out. But eventually they had to, It's uh, we're not sure whether it was a self-destruct de um, uh, detonation, uh, automatic, or whether or not uh, SpaceX pushed the button. And of course, that was the end of that. It went in a big boom, so that was it. In the meantime, we had the Starship flying away into space, and everything was going brilliantly. The three engines, uh, you had the three uh, vac space ac vacuum engines and the three Raptors all firing nicely. And um, one of the things I'll ask you to uh, notice is if you look at the oxygen and the methane gauges, you will see that the uh, oxygen is not being used as fast as the methane, which is which is normal, and that's how and that's how it is through most of the flight. But once we got to seven minutes four seconds, of the uh, we could see it flying away. There was this sudden outgassing, and you can see it this fan shaped. At first, people thought it was just something like the sun catching the um, the exhaust plume um, and things like that. Um, and I, I'm, I'm doing my usual thing. I'm using my cursor, which I know you can't see, to point things out. So, <laughs> doing that. Um, so we'll go carry on. As you can see, this out gas outgassing lasted for quite a few seconds. Um, and it's, uh, we're getting towards the uh, end. So we, I've just scrolled it back a little bit on this image. You can see now this is uh, when it's all normal. You can see the bright dot. Well, that's all the actual vehicle. Uh, flying away into the distance, and again, the um, on this image uh, you can see the telemetry at the bottom, but they've highlighted. Um, uh, I think this was um, who, who was it? It wasn't Marcus House. It was, um, was Man. About it, uh, Mr. Manley, uh, who did oh, this right. uh, breakdown. Yeah. So um, Scott May is there, um, and, but you can actually see what, as I said, the locks was not used at the rate that the methane was. I mean, that's what's normal. But what we'll do is if you watch that panel, 
So we start out gassing. Have you noticed how the lot the oxygen is virtually caught up with the methane? Yeah. All of a sudden, the oxygen was um, uh, being used at a faster rate than the methane. So we'll carry on. There, it's almost exactly the same. So we're seven mm -hmm. minutes thirty six in, um, and then what happens is um, it's you, you. I think that's one of the the probably. Uh, you can see it's just all like one of the it's actually people. the oxygen is 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 uh, uh, almost is, is below the actual methane. Now I don't know if you can see, but just above the center, you'll see that there's a little bright dot, and there's a bit of a a, a ring around it. Now this happened, and then it was followed by. You can see that there's actually a bigger uh, puff at the time, and all telemetry was lost. Yeah, and uh, I have got some uh, other images here which show the uh, explosion uh, expanding, mm. just in a different in black and white, so you can actually see it better. Um, it was uh, now it, it's determined. It's been determined that the uh, detonation system uh, kicked in again uh, to destroy the rocket. Uh, hopefully, um, SpaceX have got the data to explain why it it did that. But um, NOAA, uh, the American Space Agency, and this is thanks to Jonathan McDowell uh, and Kenneth, Kenneth Howard from NOAA, who uh, produced these images. And you can see NOAA on their weather radar uh, satellite was able to pick up the stream of debris uh, out across the Atlantic. And this is the actual starship um, uh, coming back down to Earth uh, in pieces. So we know it actually did break up and find found, formed quite a long uh, debris um, line. And then the last image is of, um, again, this is NOAA. This is the Gulf of Mexico, and this is the remains of the blue and the green uh, dots. That's the debris field falling back to where from the actual booster. So it appears that, um, that, that SpaceX have got a bit of work to do. Um, the launch pad was virtually unscathed. There was only some minor damage um, to the quick release, wasn't it, Andy, you said? Yeah, the quick release arm um, um, suffered it, uh, not too bad. It was just bent out of shape a bit and appeared to lose a bit lose a little bit of piping but yeah. but nothing serious and they're already fixing it so that's yeah. no problem so, and and the the rest of the pad was in in an excellent condition hardly touched at all so the deluge system did its job uh there was no um uh, destruction of the pad we had no uh, rocks being thrown around everywhere mm. um uh, which basically the whole system worked worked uh, fine can i just um, say does um yeah, on, put it in some sort of perspective the fact that spacex managed to design build test and run mm. the water deluge system delivering those four hundred thousand gallons at three thousand psi successfully and they've done all of that since april um whereas it might have taken you know somebody like nasa years to do uh, is absolutely incredible, and mm. and, it, and it worked perfectly. Uh, so this is what they will be using in future to prevent damage to the uh, the orbital launch mount, and of, obviously those those poor sharks in the Gulf of Mexico that we talked about. Um, and of course, um, Elon's talking about is it four weeks for the next flight? Yeah, it, Elon said Elon that, time. Um, yeah, he, he expects the, the the third orbital launch attempt to be sometime in December. So we're looking mm. at possibly May or. Or, or June for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so anyway, but thank you, Daz. That was wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful. Uh, you know, it was a bit of a sad end, but you know, look, look what they've learned. They've they've managed to successfully launch a rocket with all thirty three of its engines working this time. The hot staging worked perfectly. Apparently, the first time it was tried, although they may need to to change the flight profile of the the booster, especially when it flips over for the boost back burn and relighting those engines by anybody's criteria, a wonderful success. So thank you, Daz, for that. And uh, again, if you were watching us, uh, uh, watching with us live on Saturday, thank you for being there. All right. So um, I think we'll start wrapping things up for the evening, unless anybody's got anything else to say. 
Um, no, that was fantastic. So we would like to... Um, Andrew says that they designed the water deluge system before April. Oh, and, right. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, still, it still needed um, building and... Yeah, yeah, uh, you're, you're probably like right, Andrew. So, Thank you for that. Of course, we, when, when we were talking about how often it's going to be used, this... Um, sort of creates a problem because we know that this is very important for the first stages of artemis mm. because it's actually going to be as you said the moon lander mm. um and um it's but before that we you just got to be refueled and everything so it's going to involve be involved in uh, uh lots of flights which have got to happen in very quick succession yeah so boca chica if they're um if they do get to restricted uh, on anything, um, and if they think it's only going to be used to uh, 12 launches, then they're going to have to uh, hurry up uh, down at uh, the Cape and uh, get that one running as well so that they can uh, do all these launches and get the thing refueled. So, um, hope that hope that was well, all plain. So, yeah, thanks. Yeah, so yeah, thank you for that. That's fantastic. All right, then. So, um, well, it's, Pete, it's been great having having you uh, yeah. having you with us this evening. And um, and we hope you will be back next week with us if you can. If he's not gallivanting round, <laughs> yeah, yeah, going nowhere now till next year. Uh, yeah. Okay then. Okay. Are then. you are you going to come uh, in my direction anytime, Pete? Um, probably towards the end of next year, I should imagine. Oh, okay. All right. So uh, yeah, well, you must come and see us, obviously, if you are Absolutely. anywhere anywhere near. And uh, that'd be fantastic. Like to say thank you to Lou, thank you to Roger, thank you to Daz, thank you, our audience, for, for being here tonight. And uh, just before we go, don't forget if you would like to buy us a coffee, then uh, this is the this is the code to scan. But uh, the full information on how to do this is also in the in the link of the video. Don't forget our space oddities t-shirts and uh, and hoodies, which uh, full details in the in the details of the video as well in the description of the video. So uh, next week, we will be welcoming Sinead Mannion as our special guest. Now, Sinead is a, a young lady who received a scholarship from um, uh, set up by Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell, famed radio astronomer and discoverer of pulsars. And she has set up a scholarship for science students who are disadvantaged in some way in society. And Sinead is the recipient of that, and she will be telling us all about that uh, next week because it sounds an absolutely fascinating thing to uh, to, to to gain. So uh, Sinead will be chatting to us next week about that and other things uh, because, um, as I said to her, the uh, the where she works, she's an undergraduate student and um, she's working at an institute that used to be called the Institute for the Intersection of Light and Matter. So I can't wait to find out what, what that's all about. Apparently they just call it the physics building, but, um, but, uh, but yeah, true. Um, but anyway, uh, that sounds intriguing. We'll be chatting to Sinead anyway next week. So I hope you'll welcome her uh, as, as I know you will. And then just a reminder on the 12th of December, we have got Dr. Niall Smith talking about bioforming and bioforming is the idea of seeding alien planets with life from earth, particularly um, single cell life and bacteria. And uh, and he'll be telling us all about that idea. It's something he came up with with a colleague, and uh, it is absolutely fascinating, uh, interesting project. And then in um, in January um, we have uh, uh, Dr. Frank Prendergast, who will be telling us all about uh, archaeoastronomy in relation to some of the Neolithic sites in Ireland. So that's uh, that's something to look forward to. So, so there we are. So we'd like to thank you for being with us. We hope you have a fantastic week. Uh, stay safe, look after each other. And thank you for watching us on Space Oddities. And we will see you at uh, 8 p.m. again, UK time next week. So from all of us here at Space Oddities, have a fantastic week. Have a fantastic Bye week. Bye for now. And goodbye. <laughs>